everyone hear me up at the back? Uh, I think it's working, hopefully. Um, as Wera said, I'm going to set up um, the Oliver and I'm going to describe how we got to the 2017 excavation. We were challenged to make sure that no one falls asleep after their nice lunch with a nice glass of wine. So the only way we can do that is to show you some of the wonderful things that we discovered just a couple of months ago uh, on East Lomond. Um, and what I've done to start is synthesise the 2014 trial excavation that we did. And I'll tell you what we made of what we found there and why the Stewardship Trust then picked this up. Uh, the objectives that we had for the 2017 excavation. And I'm going to do that by identifying a number of things which we thought from the 2014 excavation were key signifiers about this site. And I'm going to start with this signifier on the back of the, the front slide. And it's the carving of the bullstone, or an oxen, or a, 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 a cattle. I actually think when you look closely at the carving, uh, if you put your glasses on, you can see why we believe it's a bullstone. But I'll say no more about that and leave you to make up your own mind. And it's not like one of the stylized bullstones from, from Burkhead. It's actually more akin to the kind of thing that you would see in the Beams Caves uh, in Fife. Um, but whatever, it's recognized as a symbol of power and of wealth. And this was found on the slopes of East Lomond in around 1920 on one of the tumbles of uh, stones on the side of the hill. So that is the first signifier. Um, this is an illustration by Bob Marshall. And I want to say to you that this image is far more than a best guess. Bob actually walked up over the hill with us. The topography of the hill is accurate. Where some of the stone walls are, are accurate. And where we've been digging is also accurate in the annex in the front. We've been digging outside the Shedwood Monument on the shoulder of the hill that looks towards the Firth of Forth. And we know what we have here is a hugely impressive monument. This is one of my favourite slides, and I've used this from the Canmore site. And I use this black and white image simply to show the sheer effort, the sheer man-made effort that has gone in to construct and shape this hill. A number of consecutive rings uh, around the hill, pathways still clear, and I think the black and white image does justice to what has been clearly a huge effort in ancient times to make this iconic hill the special place that we believe it is. Here's an aerial shot of our 2014 excavation, um, and you can see looking above one of the uh, key features that Oliver will talk a bit more about is the square box, which we thought at one point was a kist, but it turned out to be something rather more special than that, and we have some other images of that. And you'll see what we thought originally was a wall, which we now believe to be a paved walkway area, a raised paved walkway area in the site. Um, what I can say about this, remembering this dig, is that not all days were like this up in this 1500 foot hill. Um, but it was typical Scottish archaeology. But the vistas and the commanding vistas from the top of the hill are really quite astonishing. It's very easy to imagine that whoever was living up here with his retinue was controlling a whole swathe of the Fife coastline looking over to the fourth. From this hill, you can see the Southern Highlands. You can see Shihali on the west coast. You can see Dundee, St Andrews, and all up the Fife coast. This is a commanding position uh, that this hill fort had. Some of the other assemblies from 2014, uh, various, various items, but this tells us clearly that there was food production going on uh, up on the hill. Uh, there's crucible fragments, and we'll say, Oliver will say a bit more about that. There's clearly been metal working uh, and furnace activity, wet stones, <coughs> and a number of shale and jet uh, pieces of jewellery, and we, we, we took even more uh, from the ground in uh, this year's excavation. This year's excavation yielded over 100 finds from a 5 by 10 metre trench as we, as we went down uh, and over. We'll say a bit more about that. <coughs> One of the key finds from 2014 was this image here. Oops. Um, and we really weren't sure what it was when we first picked it out. We thought it was maybe some fine working Pictish 
Silver Smiths tool, <laughs> thinking about the, the, the Norris logo just along, along the road. But actually, it turns out to be a horse's bridle bit. And uh, with thanks to Alex Rowe from St Andrews University, uh, he identified something very similar at Tinmundun, uh, 7th century, down uh, in Dumfries and Galloway. And when we showed this to a saddler who was doing some work at a craft symposium uh, at Falkland uh, last year, it was the first thing she said, oh yes, this is part of a horse's bridle bit. These end pieces, which actually sit at 90 degrees to each other, are always breaking them off, always breaking them, and I'm always repairing them. So we have a horse's bridle bit, another signifier of status and uh, elite activity. Only a powerful person on top of this hill would be someone who could afford horses or people with horses uh, in his retinue. Another signifier, um, two stones. This is the first one, double disc in, in, in the mirror. Pretty simple stones, taken from the buyer of a barn on Westfield Farm, which is on the slopes of East Lowland. And this was in 1970, 72. Um, and they are now, uh, you can see them in the, the town hall in Falkland, in the nice glass case. These are not small stones, these are stones that sit so high, they are, cut, they are monumental stones, they are large Pictish carvings which testify to Pictish activity or occupation of this hill uh, in some time in the past. And the notched rectangle, uh, another uh, recognisably uh, Pictish symbol stone, symbols being consistent across East and North Scotland, we know for sure that the Picts uh, were here uh, on this site. That's another signifier, I'm going to, and I'm going to sum up all these signifiers now. We have enormous man-made construction, bullstone, indication of wealth, status, power. We discovered a kiln uh, and, and metalworking uh, activity. We have evidence of food and textile production and activity related to the horsemanship. <coughs> Together with the monumental British stonework, at the end of our assimilation of what we got from this trial excavation in 2014, we believed we were looking at a very high status site, uh, pointing to a possible kingship site of the southern Pictish kingdoms. Some uh, dating samples um, we took, uh, and some C14 dating from uh, the 2014 uh, excavation, and the square, the red square at the bottom where we get these dates from 562 and 650, that's where we decided we would go back to in 2017. There were another couple of trenches in 2014 which gave us some other very interesting dates. Uh, and so we're looking here at an outer area of the hill fort, not in the Shadow Park, with dates from the 1st century to the 7th century uh, AD, uh, with occupation deposits, uh, significant occupation deposits uh, from the main period, which is where we go back to. And at that, I believe, Oliver, I'm going to simply say that work was undertaken through the Living Lowlands Landscape Partnership, which was a three-year project that finished in 2016. Uh, the trust board, where, where I sit at Falkland, which is part of this 4,000-acre old royal estate, decided that the archaeology was so important that we would want to pick this up. So we set about fundraising, pulling people together, and deciding a number of aims for a further excavation for 2017. And this is what the board agreed. And after a process, we were delighted to reappoint Oliver to lead uh, on the 2017 excavation. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Oliver, who gets to show you all the juicy new stuff for then here's the archaeologist. So please welcome and thank you, Oliver O'Day. Hello, good afternoon. It's uh, lovely to be here. Um, thank you, Joel and Moira. Uh, Joe, that's a, a fantastic summary of the exciting 2014 uh, dig. But as I said, I'm going to give you the bang up to date record. Uh, we had a hundred or more small finds, but there were many more uh, general context collected finds. So we've got a lot to get through. So if there's anything that I pass over that you burningly want to know more about, do come and find me afterwards or ask it the questions, because some of it I will pass over. For those of you who don't know East Lomond Hillfort, it's just above Falkland uh, Estate and Village uh, here, uh, pretty much smack bang in the middle of Fife. 
And here is the location of the trench on the hill. Uh, let's see if we can get this to work. Other way around, perhaps. There we go. Uh, so, as you can see, we're actually outside the main known rampart. But one of the things that the 2014 dig identified was a previously unknown series of annexes here. So, uh, we believe we are still within the hill fort proper. And here is the post excavation plan from 2014, all these structures that Joe was referring to. We only got the very most basic sense about how these all relate to each other and what exactly they were, including uh, these. Uh, post settings up here. So one of the things we wanted to do is figure out what was going on. So we opened up another trench over here to try and trace where this feature was going. And this is a, a very much kind of working aerial shot. So some of the features have been sectioned by this point. But it gives you a general sense of the, the spread of remains across the area. And one of the features that we particularly want to investigate, as Joe referred to, is, is this box feature, which uh, was one of the first things we actually found in 2014 and understand how it related to all these pavings and what exactly it was. So th this is it in uh, 2014, we cross-sectioned it, half-sectioned it, it had these very strange uh, coloured sandstone uh, slabs in the base of it and uh, burnt material. Um, so we exposed this and we could see that one of the stones had fallen in, so it was actually a box setting, and the paving went across most of the, the base um, of it, or, or lining if you will, and under that was a lining of clay up in all the cracks, slightly overcut on one side, but not to worry, and bedded in with this was lots of charcoal and small fragments of slag. So this left us with one possibility that this could be a very rare metalworking quenching tank um, from the uh, late Iron Age period, and some of the reasons why we also think that's the case is because of the remains that are found around it. So there was this pit over here, which uh, one of our volunteers bought is just digging. It's immediately to the south of that feature, and it had a large lump of uh, iron slag on top of it, probably from the base of a uh, smithing hearth or furnace. And indeed, the interior of this pit had a lot more of this material, but not in situ, so all the subsoil was not burnt. So this isn't an actual furnished structure as such. It's a, uh, a debris pit. And we also uncovered it right at the base, it, that it was truncating a hearth. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about that later, because it revealed a lot more was going on in this site than we previously thought. Another part of the work we did to identify metal working on the site was a hammer scale survey across this area with, with magnets. And we found that indeed there was lots of hammer scale present. And this is the bits of metal that are thrown up when a smith literally hits iron um, on an anvil. And this is in situ, and it's spread across this whole area. Here's some examples of what I'm talking about, little shirts. And its density, highest density, was down here. So indeed, we have a possible quenching pit, at least a tank holding water, a debris um, a pit that had a radial carbon date from 650 AD, so this is early medieval, Pictish if you will, and an active, active Smith's workshop, probably, as classically as the case, beyond the trench, unfortunately. Uh, but fantastic evidence of in situ metalworking within the annex of the early medieval fort. Uh, we also found this interesting feature immediately across from our tank. We believe this is the robbed out uh, remains of a smithing hearth. So this is the base of a hearth which has been used in a metalworking process. It is remarkably burnt. It has been under intense heat. The whole subsoil around it in a large circular area was burnt to bits. So it's all very red. All the lower deposits from earlier occupation has been burnt. Um, so that was a fantastic find, and we're talking to uh, Gemma Cruikshank, who's just completed a PhD on all these, to find some comparatives. It's a very rare thing to find. Uh, we also found lots of this. Uh, this is uh, metalworking ceramic, so it's probably come from the walls of kilns, um, which suggests there may in fact be smelting on the site, so the melting of uh, metal as well. Uh, but this one was particularly exciting because we showed it to Ewan Campbell and he's pretty sure that this little scalloped form here that you can see is the actual hole where a bellows has been stuck into a bung. So this is a ceramic bung 
which has been stuck into the face of a furnace and has melted metal all along the side of it. We also found a few of these. The, this is a mould. Uh, this is an ingot mould, in fact, a very rare discovery. Uh, there was only one other found at this site. Um, it's a very unusual thing to find, but they are known from hill forts in the Iron Age period and early medieval. We didn't know whether this one had been used. It could be a silver ingot mould, which was particularly exciting, but XRF analysis has drawn a blank. So it may not have actually been used, but we're going to have the soil that was in the inside also uh, looked at with the same uh, analysis. So hopefully we'll be able to tell a bit more. But it is broken, so it might have just been used and then abandoned, uh, made and then abandoned rather. But all great evidence of what Joe referred to as signifiers of power, metalworking within hill forts, patronising people of power. So we have this paving area as well, next to our 7th or earlier century metalworking site, and this stone turned up, and we were fascinated by this. It's a schist quartz stone, not local to Fife. Uh, so Joe himself dug this out, and it turned out to be worked. It has these curious markings, much debate as to whether these are natural or man-made, but I'm reliably informed by John Barland, uh, Borland, who's been drawing this, that they are very likely natural. Uh, but there are other features on the stone which are worked. So with the edge of it, the base is flat, and there's also this socket, the remains of a socket down here. We think this is a quern stone, uh, a broken quern stone. Very similar to examples from parts of Perthshire. So this is uh, from the Black Spout, for instance. Um, the other feature that we really wanted to look at was this, which we think is more likely to be uh, a routeway, a path, because it's metalled on top, has a curb on it, and underneath is beautifully laid a uh, series of slabs paving. But as I said earlier, we traced it through the landscape as well. So there's much debate either whether it was a building, but in fact it seems to go through the landscape over 15 metres. And here's an example of where it was traced by school children. They had lots of fun chasing it about the landscape. Um, and here's another example. So you can see the metalworking area. Now, this is rare archaeology. You just don't really get roadways from uh, Scottish upland sites. Um, some people said it can't be a roadway. There's no examples of this. There is one um, in Edinburgh Castle. Uh, the excavations there by uh, Yeoman and Driscoll uncovered very, very similar feature. And this is a site with Roman Age activity, early medieval activity, very important power centre as we know. And they couldn't date this very well. They said it can't be later than the 1000 or so, 11th century. We've got much tighter evidence. It's truncated by a 650 metalworking pit. So this is early medieval, yeah? It's a post-Roman, perhaps. Um, and a great feature. And in fact, had phasing as well. There are earlier levels to it underneath and fines coming out from the side of it and underneath, including iron fines. This particularly beautiful one, once uh, cleaned up, turned out to be a very fine uh, iron uh, spearhead. Uh, it's similar to Anglo-Saxon examples from about the 4th century, 5th century, um, and is fantastic. And it still has the mineralised remains of the spear wood inside it. We found about four of these, which are uh, spear pummel ends, butts, um, which are uh, late Iron Age as well. So there's military at this site. And a key early medieval find as well is this, which Ewan Campbell has kindly confirmed as Ewear. This is imported from 5th, 6th century France, um, up the west coast of Britain most likely. It's the fourth example from eastern Scotland. It's probably traded from the West as a diplomatic gift. But the kind of things that were inside these pots is things like olive oil, madder dyes. So it's a remarkably important find to have made at East Loman and puts it up there with the key power centres. Here is the area I've just been telling you about, rather rapidly. So I want you to think about the, the, the south side as the early medieval remains. But as we come across to this side, we have a different story, a settlement story, um, and an earlier story as well. And here we've got an equally, if not more remarkable, discovery of stacked hearths. These are remarkably well preserved. Uh, we, we had at least five phases, although we didn't get to the bottom of all of them. 
And the building that these relate to, the hearths relate to, uh, are probably wooden. So we've got lots of these in a large curve around this. We're talking about a very large structure. We only just revealed part of it. That's been occupied over generations. So we've got extraordinary continuity here within the outer part of the fort as well. And we've got great finds. So as I said, this is an earlier story. Um, we're getting shale objects like this fantastic large arm armlet, shale armlet. Um, it, shale is native to, to Fife's. This may have been bought in locally, Burnt Island, a place like this. It is a, a damaged object that wasn't completed. It would have been to high sheen in its day. But we did get some examples of complete ones. So this is a, a probably fourth century corded shale or jet ring, which was found uh, spread down the slope from the, the, the building. Uh, good examples of these from Yorkshire and burial contexts. Uh, Lindsay Allison Jones has studied these. So we're pretty certain it's 4th century. So as you can see, we're getting into the Roman Iron Age period, which is where it gets really exciting, because we've got lots of this. This is late Roman pottery, uh, at least about 10 sheds or more from, uh, just a few more, from the, the, the bases uh, of the floor levels of this building. These are Oxford ware uh, shares, and we're very fortunate to have uh, Fraser Hunter look at these for us. And they're drinking vessels, at least two vessels from the site uh, selected, maybe diplomatic gifts to the power centre here. But they also had some fine objects of their own. So this is a native pin, uh, a, a, a copper alloy pin, uh, a rosette headed pin. Um, and it's a great find as well, because it's got quite a thin distribution, though a wide one. One from Cove C, a uh, collection from Trepain Law, and a few outliers in the southwest. And it shows, you know, that there's a development of native uh, modes and expressions within metalwork in its time. They're developing new ways of talking about themselves through objects, probably influenced through Ireland and other ring-headed pins at the time. We've got some more finer bits of copper plate and also some decorative pieces of ironwork. Uh, but our hearths had earlier phases, as I said, and this is one example of a find from the hearth which dated one of the early phases to the first, second century. This is a, a type 1 glass armlet, and they are found in the north and in the Roman world as well. And um, as I said, we've got earlier hearths as well. Under our hearth and metalworking, we've got two additional hearths. So we're beginning to get a picture at East Loman of an extraordinary depth of occupation. Very rare, again. Uh, this Iron Age uh, curious polished stone ball and a piece of glass um, uh, bead. And also more um, lovely glass. This is part of a Type 2 armlet, as you can see, beautifully made cording on the top. So there's really fine um, wares and decorative jewellery at this site. And that places this find within the wider distribution. It's northern uh, Britain, uh, along the wall, uh, the frontier in southern Scotland. And this ties in again, this Roman influence, a melon bead, 1st, 2nd century. And this part of a Roman vessel. This is a, a foot ring um, from a Roman vessel um, from these first, second century levels. Uh, perhaps a good comparison. A bit later is this. So this is at the base of a larger vessel. Um, so there's a huge amount of Roman material coming in to this site. I mean, we've only excavated 1% of it, and there's probably a lot more to be found, we would hope. And here's some other examples from Roman finds from the area. Um, this, this 4th century coin, and it ties in with uh, great evidence coming out from other places in Fife, like the Dercy Hoard, the earliest hack silver in the Roman world. Uh, and there are only two Roman camps in Fife as well. Um, it's uh, Octomacti and Cooper, and we have the Carpo uh, Legionary Fortress as well on the Tay from the 3rd century. But all the evidence sort of points towards the fact that are we dealing with a client tribe here at East Lomond? And that's a really exciting point that we're hoping to develop more. 
but I can see that time's ticking on, so I'm going to tell you finally about one of our real surprises at the end of the dig, was this, um, this stone structure. This is one of our diggers, Ellie uh, Milliken, digging into it. And it turned out to be uh, what we think may be a robbed out cairn of some kind. One side is gone, and inside we had this stone-lined kist feature. And she was just excavating, Ellie, uh, the remains of a series of cremated bone deposits. Next to which we found a little shale or jet bangle, and inside of which we also found this, once it had been studied at the National Museums with Alice and Sheridan, um, this is a bone toggle. So it's a bit of evidence that may be dealing with some kind of cremation remains. The only problem is, so bashed about that we didn't get any human bones confirmed as yet. So the jury is out, we need radiocarbon dates to confirm this. There's a few theories, could it be a robbed and reused prehistoric cairn, or could it be something a bit later, could we be dealing with a Pictish cairn? Either way, interestingly enough, it seems to roughly align with Bishop Hill, which is quite a nice thing. And it adds to a wider sense about the curious things going on at East Lomond. In the top of this cairn, we had a lump of iron ore, and we had the remains of a spear butt stuck in the side of it. It all looks a bit ritual. It suggests there's votive deposits associated with this. And I would posit one other possibility, although we'll have to see the radio come dates. Are we looking at a horned Pictish cairn? Discuss. Um, but we will let you know how this develops. There is a huge amount of material to be uh, studied and explained, but I think uh, Joe will agree with me that it went far beyond our expectations, this dig. And we think we've uncovered you know, one of the very well-preserved late Iron Age sites in this part of Scotland, certainly lowland Scotland, and we hope in future years to look at exploring it further with the estate. And as you can see, much of all of this work is thanks to a huge number of local community volunteers, over seven, I, I believe, uh, local secondary schools, and upwards of 60 to 90 uh, volunteers coming along on a daily basis. So thank you to all of them, um, and we hope to tell you more about our story. One final thing before Moira calls a halt in my talk is that we're holding a conference, and it's a very special conference it's coming very soon next Saturday, the 11th of November, and we've brought together specialists in Hill Forts, including Gary Locke from University of Oxford, and also Fraser Hunter, and many more. So there are still some places available. Um, students get a discount as well. Look at the Eventbrite page and at the Falkland Centre for Stewardship um, page, and you'll find out more. Okay, I'll think of when there. Thank you. Thank you.